for our rights. They sacrificed a lot, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot, and um, I enjoy all the benefits that this great country gives me, and it's because of them. At City Hall, more honors for our veterans of World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. As Rasha Goel explains, this special recognition hit close to home for one city council member. This is the canteen that my dad wore uh, when he was fighting in the Battle of Okinawa. And uh, this canteen has a Japanese bullet hole through it. And that difference of two or three inches between hitting this canteen and hitting an artery in his hip is the difference between whether there's a Krikorian family or not. Councilman Paul Krikorian remembers his father, Rick Krikorian's bravery, while honoring 15 other veterans at City Hall. The Veteran of the Year Award was given out to these men and women for their service and sacrifice for our country. Each council member selected an honoree from their district. In service to his country, Leva joined the infantry and set out to become a United States Army Ranger. Colonel Flynn recently retired after an extraordinary 36-year military career. Whether actively serving or not, these veterans carry memories that have impacted their lives. The biggest member I have is of the, of the great people that I serve with. And uh, unfortunately, some of them never came back. And in some cases, either in heart, in mind, or because, physically. And so uh, th that's who I think of. I feel honored, but humbled, because I'm not receiving it just for myself. I'm receiving it for all the veterans that are wear the uniform, past and present. This is the third year Councilman Paul Krikorian has recognized veterans at City Hall. As the son of a World War II veteran, it is especially important to him to recognize these individuals for their service. All of those who've served, both the living and the dead, have become our teachers. Through their sacrifice, they remind us of the extraordinary potential of ordinary Americans. While many of us may see Veterans Day as part of a holiday or three-day weekend, the councilman says he hopes people will understand what this day truly stands for. In downtown Los Angeles, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. While well, turning now to what many consider a novel idea, take old surplus school parking lots and convert them into affordable housing. Anna Marco shows us why the new Selma Community Housing Project just might start a new trend in affordable housing. Little Raya Islam is the first to greet us as the family welcomes us into its new home sweet home. Can I say hello? The Islams are celebrating the grand opening of the Selma Community Housing Project in Hollywood. The unique joint-use development was a former school parking lot, but the surplus lot has been converted into 66 affordable units, housing both low-income families and LAUSD school district workers. The Islams weren't in crisis yet, but they were barely making ends meet, even with two jobs. They could only afford a one-bedroom apartment. I work in a um, Head Start program as a teacher, and my husband works for LAUSD, cafeteria worker, but still it was hard for us to afford even more if it's more than 2000 The Islam family isn't alone. Housing advocates say over half of all Californians pay more in rent than they can afford. That's what really makes me uh, motivated to do the work that we do, is sort of the outcomes that we see with the family. Once they come in from overcrowded situations or living uh, in their car, to have an opportunity to have great quality affordable housing. But now the Islams live in a beautiful three-bedroom for half the market price, with plenty of room for the kids to play and study. It's good, and it's good that I have my own room, and... And I could study by myself without my brother. A room of his own to study in, and now all Rahim has to contend with is his baby sister barging in. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. The Selma Housing Community Project received 1,500 applications for its 66 units. Many families in need were turned away, but the city and school district plan to convert more surplus parking lots into affordable housing. Moving west to the Pacific Palisades, where community members have said enough already. They want something new for their downtown, and soon they'll get it. From a celebrity developer who is reinventing the way shopping malls are built. Gil Reyes reports on the upcoming Palisades Village. 
Of all the big projects billionaire developer Rick Caruso has built, this could be the most personal one yet. It's off Sunset and Swarthmore in Pacific Palisades. My wife and I actually use this street a lot. Uh, with our four kids, we were at Mort's, we shopped at Benton's for their sporting goods, and they played at Palisades Park. So this community is special to us. Caruso, builder of the popular Grove at Farmer's Market and Americana at Brand Shopping Plaza in Glendale, breaks ground on his newest venture, Palisades Village. It's expected to turn what's now a drab downtown Pacific Palisades into an outdoor shopping and entertainment destination. Expect a similar nostalgic Main Street vibe as his other works. Palisades Village will also add a new park, several buildings, offices, a grocery store, an ice cream shop, eight residential units, and the restoration of the Bay Theater. The movie house hasn't opened since 1978. It's going to be a spectacular project, and it's built for the community, and it's all about celebrating family and friends, and I'm looking forward to the grand opening. Expect that in August 2018. At the future site of Palisades Village, I'm Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The plaza will also have three levels of underground parking with 560 spaces. Well, back at City Hall, what better way to honor a late immigrant musical artist than with a free concert? That's what the city did as it paid homage to Juan Gabriel, a singer loved by many Mexican Americans. Anna Marcos has more. A musical tribute to the late and legendary Mexican musical artist Juan Gabriel with a Dia de los Muertos theme. The legend who died earlier this fall was known for his sweet ballads, catchy mariachi tunes, and flamboyant sequin costumes. This concert at Overa Plaza celebrated his life. Juan Gabriel wrote 18,000 songs and sold more than 100 million records throughout his 45-year career. He was known and loved by Spanish-speaking audiences around the world. Juan Gabriel died of a heart attack at his home in Santa Monica on August 29th. He was 66 years old. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. It's time to dust off your ice skates as winter comes to downtown L.A. The holiday ice rink in Pershing Square officially kicked off its 2016 winter season. Olympic skater Ekaterina Gorieva and the California Gold Synchronized Skating Team took to the ice for the opening ceremony to celebrate the event's 19th season. Presenting a magical winter wonderland in the heart of historic downtown Los Angeles, this season's unique roster offers free community and special events. The 7,200 square foot rink is made of real ice and will be open until January 16th for everyone to enjoy. You can come up with, the, with your family and feel it will definitely put you in the holiday spirit. Want to take a fresh look at the immigration experience? While well, the Her Story exhibit at the Downtown Library gives us a glimpse into the struggles of Chinese American female immigrants over the last one and a half centuries. Anna Marcos has the story. They were a silent force that helped shape U.S. immigration history. These are the stories of Chinese American women who endured tragedies and discrimination, like the slavery in sweatshops in the San Francisco Chinatown of the 1800s. For some, there were hard-won triumphs. This became the first Chinese American woman to buy a mainstream U.S. newspaper in the year 2000, the San Francisco Examiner no less. It's the story of uh, Chinese American women and the struggle and accomplishments uh, for inclusion, uh, equal rights. Uh. The downtown L.A. Public Library is hosting the Herstory exhibit. Herstory, a new twist on the word history, was created and curated by Chinese-American lawyer Dr. Chang Chen. Chinese-American women in the assimilation into American citizen has faced with discrimination and fairness, everywhere in the uh, job market and the personal life and everywhere so 
they were forced to become a hero. Visitors will get a look back into the last 165 years of Chinese immigration, and there are lots of firsts. The first Chinese female immigrants to land here, who were often kept as slaves or jailed and believed to be prostitutes. The first pioneers. The first Chinese American females to become judges and legislators. The first little girl to sue segregated schools back in 1885, before segregation was even a buzzword. She was eight years old and her mother tried to put her to school, public school. But the principal greeted her in the door and go, you cannot come in. Ever wonder where we got the law that all immigrants born here are U.S. citizens? A Chinese American born here in the 1800s made history with a lawsuit and won after he went back to China to visit and was denied re-entry to the U.S. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court and finally the legal doctrine is established. It's everyone born in the U.S. is a U.S. citizen. So we all owe it to him. It's an exhibit that provides a powerful view into the immigration experience. Her story will be on exhibit at the Central Downtown Library for the next few months. I'm Anna Margos for LA This Week. The exhibit will be on display until February 26. Well, don't just eat turkey, dress up like one during this year's turkey trot. Check out the coolest cars on the market at the LA Auto Show and celebrate the culture and art of a local neighborhood. All this in this week's Things to Do. The Turkey Trot returns to downtown Los Angeles on Thanksgiving morning. Downtown, get ready. The annual Turkey Trot offers a scenic 5K and 10K route on the historic streets of Los Angeles. There will be plenty of races, games, and activities perfect for the entire family. You can really get into character and dress up like a turkey for the costume contest or just enjoy the potato sack race. A kid zone will have them busy with face painting and arts and crafts. The race benefits the Midnight Mission. It all takes place Thursday, November 24th along Temple Street. For more, visit turkeytrot.la. Car geeks rejoice. The LA Auto Show has roared into town. It's one of the largest auto shows in the world, and it always kicks off the auto show season. Call it an automotive fantasy, as car lovers get a peek at the luxe, the futuristic, and the high tech at the annual LA Auto Show and Car Expo. Dozens of vehicles are making their debut here, so there will be something for everyone. The show runs until November 27th at the LA Convention Center. For more, visit LAAutoshow.com. In the heart of Lamert Park thrives a group of community business members with a passion to develop an event rooted in the foundations of culture, art, music, and community. So on the last Sunday of the month, Lamert Park Village invites the public over to enjoy a day filled with art exhibits, music, fashion, food, drumming, and other creative endeavors for the whole family. Plenty of DJ spinning, rhymes, rapping, and poets of the spoken word combined with traditional artists and the legendary drum circle. Don't miss the fun on Sunday, November 27th at Lamert Park Village. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kane from all of us here at LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.
Graffiti removal? Call 311, the toll free number for non emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. Dragon boats are? Well, me neither. Would you believe there's dragon boats in San Pedro? Come with me as we explore dragon boats in San Pedro. Okay, we're down here in Dragon Boat Headquarters, which sounds very exciting and thrilling, which of course it is. And we're talking to Jeff. Tell me briefly about the program and what it in entails. Our, our program is all about uh, kids learning how to dragon boat race. It's a 3,000-year-old Chinese tradition. We try to do everything as a team. We go out, we paddle as a team, we clean the boat as a team. As a matter of fact, our motto is one boat, one beat. Everybody doing the same thing at the same time, trying to work together as a team. What sort of age are the kids? Right now, we have a middle school team which goes up anywhere from 7 to 15 years old. Terrific. And before we leave all these paddles behind us, what, what are they? These are all our team paddles that we use. Uh, every kid gets one. But what about kids who are watching this and saying, I want to get involved? What sort of uh, process is involved in doing this? It's very simple. All you have to do is come down on Sunday mornings and jump in the boat and try it out. And if you like it, you can join. So you don't have to have any nautical sort of maritime background? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Most of our paddlers are first-year, first-time paddlers. Why did you involve your kids in this program? It is something different. Um, a lot of people don't know about this sport, so if we could bring the awareness to the sport of dragon boat racing, you know, to the youth. That's an interesting thing. How did you hear about it? You said it's not very well known. How did you hear about it? Actually, we were happened to be walking three years ago. This is going to be their fourth year in the team. And we just happened to walk by and we saw the banner that was on the, on the gate. And then that's how I came into it. What sort of things did you learn? I mean, when you first came here, were you a bit nervous? Definitely, yeah. And you overcame your nervousness by doing what? Um, everyone was kind of nervous. Like, we were all just together, like, not knowing what to do. So everyone kind of just learned together. And when you actually got into the water, I mean, did you have any idea what to expect? Uh, not really. I kind of thought it was somewhat like kayaking, so I kind of knew, like, kind of what to do with that. And what about you? When you first went in a boat, um, have you been in the water? I mean, have you done all that kind of stuff before? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> and what, what happened when you got in the boat? How did you feel? I was nervous, but, like, our coaches were really kind and they, like, helped us through it, so they knew what to do. And when they finally graduate, if that's a word, uh, how do you feel that they will, you know, relish the whole experience? I'm proud of them. I think I'm, I, they come to practice. They have to get up early when they don't want to. This is a weekend for them. They're busy in high school as well. So this is something that, you know, they have, I'm proud of them for doing. We're talking with Dave Turple, who is a volunteer, and I applaud you being a volunteer. But I see you have an intriguing medallion around your neck. What is that? Well, I'm pretty proud of the, uh, the youth team we have here. They... Uh, they're, they're kids of all ages from up to 15 years old, and, and they won a medal last year at the Long Beach Dragon Boat Festival. The children, and these are sometimes younger than junior high kids, they competed against high school kids and actually ended up winning a medal. I'm real proud of them. I think one of the many interesting things is that dragon boating uh, apparently goes way back to, what, Asia and China? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have got no idea Dragon boating. Dragon boating is an ancient Chinese sport. And one of the things that uh, they do at the festivals that they have in Long Beach, or and, well, just about every festival, they, they have these Chinese monks come out. And Chinese monks? Chinese monks. Wow. And just before the dragon boat festival starts, these, these monks come out, they bless the boat, boats, and then they paint the eyes on the dragon, because each boat has a dragon head, of course. They paint the eyes on so that the dragons can, can watch and see where they're going. I think another interesting thing is when you look at a dragon boat, give our viewers an idea, what does a dragon boat cost? Most of the boats that you, you would see at a, 
festival are running around eight thousand dollars a piece. Eight thousand dollars? Eight thousand dollars. And do you have uh, <laughs> drives to generate funds to buy them? We we actually have uh, at the end of our season, at the end of our youth season, we have uh, a barbecue, and we have you know. Uh, uh, 50-50, split the pot, and then people will will donate items for the barbecue, and they will will do a bidding, and whoever bids wins it. So we we're raising a little money that way. We always we're always looking for sponsors to help cause, because one of the things that we're trying to do here is is buy ourselves a new dragon boat. Terrific. Tell me, what about uh, the kids that you're involved with? What do you feel that dragon boating program provides and gives kids today? Well, I think uh, I think mainly it, it it shows the kids teamwork. Uh, they have to work together. And actually, in the dragon boat, there's there's about 18 or sometimes 20 kids, 20 paddlers in the boat, and they sit really close to each other. So they have to all work together. It's we were just looking at uh, some kids in a dragon boat, and I guess it's obviously very important that they all paddle the same time and the same way. Oh. Absolutely, they, they've got to paddle at the same time. If they don't paddle at the same time, the, the kids are clanking paddles and they, they're just not going anyplace. If everyone works together as a team, then the boat goes fast. Looking at the kids in the boat that we just saw, um, I would imagine that this is very, um, how can I say this tactfully, very stressful on their arms. They, that's one of the reasons we have these practices. They've got to build up muscles on their arms. Uh, actually, and, and the whole, it, you get a whole body workout if you if you do it right. You lean forward, you twist your body, you use your legs to push, and use your arms to pull. To close out our conversation to people who are watching, what would you say to someone, get involved in this program because Get involved in this program because it's a healthy, fun sport for, for adults and for children. Ready? Go! It's a, a form of exercise and it's a form of mental preparedness for anything in life, basically. So there you have it, another edition of Our Chat Traveler and some more information about Dragon Boats. Until next time, I'm John Clayton, and thank you for watching. I'll see you on Armchair Traveler. Let her ride. Excellent. Cut, print, we're moving on. Hi, I'm Shane Woodson on the set of Cain and Abel here in Hollywood. You're watching LA City View, Channel 35. Our city, our channel. Okay, I need my actors back on set, back in position.
begin our work for today. Members, if you're in your...
Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is Wednesday, November 23rd. I want to welcome you to your Los Angeles City Council. This council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 o'clock. The public is welcome. Mr. Clerk, we do have a uh, quorum. Could you please call the roll? Blumenfield, Bonabusque, and El Cedillo, and Leader Harris, Dawson, Wieser, Koreska, Corin, Martinez, O'Farrell, Price, Rue, West, and 10 members present in a quorum. Mr. President. Thank you. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Mr. Cedillo moves. Mr. Corette seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Price moves. Mr. Rue seconds. That brings us where? Mr. President, items 1 through 13 are items noticed for public hearing. Cards? Cards on all items, sir. Okay, continue. Items 14 through 45 are items for which public hearings have been held. A motion is required for item 15. Would you like to hold it on the desk? Yes, we will. Very good. Okay, why don't we prepare to vote on the other items? Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. And Mr. President, those ordinances or that ord will go over uh, one week unless reconsidered later today with 12 members. That brings us to items 46 through 52. There are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. In fact, I want to go back to item 15. On item 15, I'll make the motion. I move that we adopt the uh, Entertainment and uh, Facilities uh, Committee report without objection. So on item 15, let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. And for clarification, that is uh, recommendation B on the uh, council's agenda. I love it when you clarify. <laughs> okay, now um, let's continue. Very good, sir. And again, for that item, that uh, ordinance will go over for a second read one week unless reconsidered later. That brings us to, uh, to items 46 through 52. There are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, those items are now before this body. Do we have cards? Cards on all items, sir. Okay. That brings us where? That brings us to item 53. It's an item scheduled for closed session. Would you like to hold it on the desk? In fact, I'm going to look to our city attorney. Uh, it would appear to me, Mr. City Attorney, that we would be able to deal with this item in open session. Can you give me your opinion on that? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. President. This matter was handled in Budget and Finance Committee, and it, it's a fairly standard uh, settlement matter. Uh, it can be handled in open session unless an individual council member would like to go into closed session. Okay, Mr. Clerk, why don't you read the item, and then we'll dispense of it. Very good, sir. Uh, in the case entitled Augustin Hernandez versus City of Los Angeles and George Pardo, there is a recommendation to expend $150,000 in settlement. Okay, so without objection, that'll be the order. Let's prepare to vote. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. That brings us where? Mr. President, that takes council to presentations or items called special or general public comment for items not on council's agenda. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cedillo? Yes, I'd like to reconsider item 60 on Tuesday's uh, November 22nd agenda and continue it to Wednesday, November 30th. Okay. So first we're voting on reconsideration. Let's open the roll. It, it, pardon what me, now? sir, uh, uh, and again for clarification. Uh, item 60 on yesterday's agenda is Council File 16-0339. Again, 16-0339. Okay, so let's open the roll. Uh, uh, this is on uh, reconsideration. And uh, uh, if I may, that's, uh, yes, that is may. relative to authorizing the issuance of tax-exempt multifamily housing conduit revenue bonds for the development of the Viviendas del Valle Apartments and the New York Place Apartments projects. Okay, so let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Okay, now let's uh, vote again. And I believe oh, the request in fact, was to Mr. continue. Mr. Cedillo, you wanted to... Uh, continue it to November 
to the 30th. Continue it again to what? November 30th. You have that, Mr. Clerk? Very good, sir. Okay, so then 30th. that item will be continued? Without objection, sir. Okay, so that takes us back to presentations. Let me defer to Mr. Buscaino to see if he's ready for yes. a very important presentation. Yes. I'm going to ask, wait, you're, you're taking Mr. Bonin with you? Can you? you want okay, me? then I'm going to ask uh, <laughs> Mr. Koretz. Mr. Koretz, would you please? <laughs> yeah, we need you here, Mr. President. I know okay, you Okay, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You're disrupting the meeting, Mr. Spindler and Mr. Herman. No, no, you're saying something now. Say, say something again, because if you do, you'll be removed. So I'm telling you, this is a very important presentation. So you guys are going to sit down, and you're going to be quiet, or you're going to leave the council chambers. What do you want to do? Mr. Kretz, take Thank the chair. You. Thank you, Mr. President. I believe uh, you ought to join us here. I know you have had uh, a relationship, a great working relationship with uh, Supervisor Don Kanavi. So if we can have the council president join here, join us here along with uh, Mr. Bonin, who too have done amazing work on the Metro Board with Supervisor Kanavi. Um, it's with great pleasure that we stand collectively before this body to recognize um, our colleague and the county supervisors, uh, Board of Supervisors, Supervisor Don Kanabi, and his long list of political accomplishments over his 25 years of public service. Let's give him a, a warm welcome here at LA City Council Chambers. Feels like home. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Kanabi was uh, first elected to the LA County Board of Supervisors in November of 1996 and was overwhelmingly re-elected in 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2012. He represents the Board of Supervisors' fourth district, a diverse area that is home to over two million residents in addition to some of our local economy's greatest assets, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach and the LA airport. Um, Supervisor Kanabi earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Graceland University in the great state of Iowa. He then served our country in the United States Navy and after earning honorable discharge, settled in Cerritos, California. He began his political career in 1980 when he was elected to Cerritos City Council and later served two terms as Cerritos mayor. And in 1882, just a, a, a correction, 19... <laughs> And, and in, <laughs> hopefully we don't turn this into a rose, colleagues. In, 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 in 1982, he took the position of, with Supervisor Dean Dana, quickly advancing to Chief of Staff, first elected the L.A. County Board of Supervisors in 1996 and served as Chairman of the Board of Supervisors in the 2010 session. And he is respected for the strength of his grassroots support considerable experience in local governments, which, which has made him a highly regarded voice, not only uh, in his fourth district, but throughout this country. Supervisor Kanabi has spent much of his political career working uh, to protect innocent and vulnerable children and youth in Los Angeles County. He established the Safe Surrender Program in order to save newborn babies from abandonment and has pioneered a fight against sex, child sex trafficking. He's also recognized for implementing several innovative youth programs, such as a pediatric arts program at Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Center, the Arts Education Partnership Program, which provides grants to schools and, and community-based organizations to fund visual, art, dance, music, and theater programs for students. As an advocate for an environmental initiative, Supervisor Kanabi worked to amend decades-old laws and regulations to encourage the development of conversion technologies in Los Angeles County as an alternative to landfills. He has also led the county's effort to improve water quality, uh, 19, approving 19 projects within the 4th District that continue to lower pollution and divert stormwater uh, from the ocean. Most recently, Supervisor Kanabi announced the launch of Operations Libraries, an initiative to invest $45 million in libraries in the 4th District. In San Pedro, uh, just yesterday, Supervisor Kanavi led an effort 
to revitalize and redevelop the San Pedro Courthouse and gain unanimous support to enter into an ENA with the developer, the Holland Partners. And we feel that the San Pedro Courthouse will be the epicenter of our revitaliza revitalization efforts in the downtown San Pedro area, which will complement our arts and entertainment district and the new San Pedro public market. We work together with the extension of the Silver Line to uh, a direct shot from downtown Los Angeles to San Pedro, which ends now at the port to bring visitors and, and, and welcome everyone from across the region uh, to the, San, the LA waterfront. We work together, the San Pedro, say San Pedro, South Bay Councils of Government to uh, identify source, funding sources uh, to address the homeless outreach efforts in the South Bay communities, including San Pedro, Wilmington, and Harbor City. Um, Supervisor Kanabi and his wife, Julie, uh, have been married for 48 years and have two sons and four grandchildren. And at the end of the year, he will step down in his position due to term limits. I've often said term limits should be elections, Mr. Bonin. But uh, that's what they used to be. After serving us for 20 years on the Board of County Supervisors. So it's an honor to have him with us to present uh, and acknowledge his years of service. I do um, now would like to ask our council president, no, like I, okay, to Mr. Bonin, that's the president, yes sir. Mr. Bonin to say a few words. Um, um, and as I mentioned, um, Mike has had a great working relationship with, with Don throughout the years. and. I want to remind him that this is not a roast, Mike, but say a few words. I don't know if you're going to hold back. Mike Bonin. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. So uh, I've had the opportunity to work with Supervisor Kanabi f in various capacities for close to 20 years now for various elected officials and then for the past three and a half years uh, serving with each other on the Metro Board of Directors. And after listening to his comments about the city of Los Angeles for the past three and a half years on the Metro Board of Directors, I just want to welcome you to enemy territory. Uh, uh, You're one of 88 cities, right? <laughs> uh, Don, uh, Don and I actually often disagree. We disagree on a lot of stuff about our overlapping jurisdictions. We've disagreed on a lot of stuff on the Metro Board. Um, we've fought over where sewer lines should go in the marina. We've disagreed over uh, certain development projects in the marina. We've disagreed over uh, Measure M, and we're often at the opposite ends of discussions on the Metro Board. And uh, there has never been, ever, a time when there's a disagreement with Don Kanabi that continues more than three seconds after the vote. Uh, Don is uh, uh, the, the, the ultimate example of what politics used to be at its best and is too rarely now, where people can disagree on an issue and still be friends afterwards and still find ways the next day or on the next issue, on the next item on the agenda, to find ways to work together. Uh, he's an incredible gentleman. He's incredibly civil. And uh, I, I should note, though, that there's a lot of things that we have worked on together. Uh, over the years, when I worked with Congresswoman Harmon in the wake of 9-11, uh, there was no greater voice in Los Angeles County for homeland security and making sure that our airport and our port were safe than Don Kanabi. Uh, he was recognized nationally for his role and his voice in doing that. Uh, we've represented LAX together, and Don has always been someone who shared the, the philosophy that I've had for a very long time, is that we can and we must modernize that airport and we can do it in a way that can be friendly to the, the communities that surround it. And that's a vision that's becoming real now, thanks to the, the groundwork that, that Don d laid for a couple decades now. But I also think that you know, it's fair to judge someone's record in public service by uh, how well they have and how often they have stood up for people who are vulnerable and people who are voiceless. And Don Kanabi, over the past several years, has been a remarkable, spokesperson uh, and champion for survivors of sexual trafficking, particularly children. He is a national voice on that. He has gone to Washington and he has testified on that. Uh, it has become a passion of his. You can see uh, uh, legislative work from his office on a regular basis on that and leadership on that. Uh, and he has been one of the first and the most eloquent elected officials I know saying that there is no ever 
10-year-old or 12-year-old who chooses to be a prostitute, right. that these are victims and that these are survivors, and he has helped people turn their lives around. And the other program that, that he's really known for for children is uh, the Safe Surrender Program. Uh, because of him, over 125 newborns were safely surrendered within 72 hours of their birth uh, uh, and, and were given a, a, a different opportunity for life that wouldn't have existed were it not for the, the, the program that Don put together. Uh, Don is also uh, one of the, the earliest and strongest champions of Homeboy. Uh, among elected officials in Los Angeles County. He was honored by them last year. Uh, he's, a, he's a hero in those circles for the work he's done. Um, but I think the thing he's probably most proud of is uh, his family, uh, his kids and his beautiful grandkids uh, that I've seen him take uh, to events before. Uh, he's just got a, a really, really rich legacy. And there's a, a secret about Don. You know, Don, Don, is, um, Don is actually my fashion consultant. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, where I learned it was acceptable to represent the coastal area and not wear a tie. <laughs> and uh, I've also seen Don in shorts. And I'll tell you, this guy has remarkably shapely, shapely calves. Uh, he has incredible calves. I comment on it all the time. Um, and he's not going far. Uh, in retirement, uh, he's going to continue his public service. He's already been drafted, and he is on jury duty a week after he steps down from the Board of Supervisors. So, Don, thanks for having Thank you, Mike. Again, help me welcome our Council President, who has known Don for many, many years and has had a working relationship, uh, our Council President, Herb Wesson. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Don Kanabi is uh, uh, the perfect example of what is so, so wrong with term limits. He is, you won't find a more skilled or artful public servant elected today than, than Don Kanabi. And I stood here today and I heard uh, our, our colleagues uh, Mr. Buscaino and Mr. Bonin talk about the Safe Surrender program and this program and that program that Mr. Kanabi uh, has worked on. But let me tell you about a program that he worked on which is very near and dear to me. And that was the Educate Herb Wesson program. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Uh, President, would you, uh, I've already warned Mr. Herman not to disrupt this presentation. He did it just now. If he does it again, I would expect that you will remove him or I will. So I don't want to hear you, Mr. Herman, until I finish. Today is not the day to play around. Today is a day we honor someone who deserves to be honored. Members in our lives, there are going to be a handful of people that make you the public servant that you are. In my life, I've been blessed by about a handful. But I can't think of one that has had more to do with me becoming the individual, the public servant that I am, the elected official that I am. Can't think of one person that that helped me more than Don Kanabi. Now I'm going to say this, and I mean this with all due respect. I worked for Councilman Nate Holden, and I love him, and he gave me my first shot in this business. But Councilman Holden's philosophy was he wanted to be the one. If there were, the vote was 14 to 1, he wanted to be the one. He wanted to be the rebel. That really wasn't who I was, and it was Don Kanabi that came right before my boss, Yvonne Burke, was sworn in, and he liked me. I, 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 think, he'd, I, I, I think he just liked me because I was cuddly or something. I, I, don't, I don't know what it was, but he spent a lot of time in just 
teaching me about the budget. I mean, when I was here with the city, I didn't really work on the budget because we were always against the budget, okay? <laughs> I didn't, we didn't influence the budget because we were always against the budget. But when I went over to the county and then Don and I connected, and I mean, it did not take long for us to connect, and he would sit down with me and, and break things down and explain it yeah. step by step. So for four years prior to Mr. Kanabi being elected supervisor, our offices, Dean Dana's office, where he was the chief, Yvonne Burke's office, where I was the chief, for those four years, those two offices directed the budget. Do you hear me on that, Michael? Directed the budget for four years. I can remember one year, things were just going so smooth, and back then, uh, Mr. Rue, you're one of the youngest members, so this is back in the olden days, <laughs> where we had a big uh, board, remember, Don, where they would write? Right. So if you were taking five million away, they would literally subtract it from this board. So Don and I had, had figured out, I mean, it's like a chalkboard. Wow. And you'd have one, one of the staff from, uh, I guess, the CAO's office, and they would just. Yeah, that was back in 1882. Yeah, it was back in 1882, like Mr. Buscaino <laughs> referenced earlier. So we're, we're, we're going through it, and all of a sudden, the math doesn't add up. Supervisor Gloria Molina goes crazy, right? What are you guys doing, you cetera? Anyway, and I remember looking at Don, and he looked at me and kind of nodded, and I said to her, I said, it's human error. It's, we did, did, trust me. So she goes all crazy, and I tell the supervisor, just tell them to relax and they relaxed, they redid it, Don and I were right, and the budget happened exactly the way that we said that, that it was going to happen, and that happened year after year after year. But I wouldn't have been prepared when I got to the legislature if it wasn't for the lessons that I learned from Don Kanabi. And the one thing that Don didn't know, once he did get elected and he was the supervisor, my office alone controlled the budget because your chief of staff was new. So thank you for, <laughs> for <laughs> thank you for teaching me. The, uh, we had a saying, we are not elected, we are selected. And when you are selected, uh, it's a big difference than when the, difference than when the people um, elect you. And, um, I'll never forget when he was elected. I sat on that floor, the Board of Supervisors, with such pride to see my very best friend in government become uh, the supervisor of that district, a job that I think he was born uh, to do. And he has been my friend ever since. Uh, he's a, the type of person that he has yet to meet a problem that he didn't try to fix. He doesn't run away from difficult issues. He doesn't run away from challenging issues. In all of the years that we've worked together, you've never heard us say Democrat or Republican. We always focused on the problem and the bet what could we do with this problem to try to solve it so that it could uh, take care of the constituents that he and I both loved. Again, when I went to the legislature, I was prepared to, to do the budget. I was prepared to go into leadership. So when other freshman members were running around the Capitol trying to figure out, you know, what staff to hire and do this, I was in the middle with the speaker engaged in the budget because of the lessons that I got from yes. Supervisor uh, Don Kanabi. He also taught me how important it is, and I will give this quickly lesson to each and every one of you. 
You have to have balance in, in, in this political life. You cannot just, just work. You have to have time that you spend with your family and time that you spend with yourself. And I learned that from Don. We would go on trips to Washington, D.C., where we would have meetings like every half hour on the hour. But when the, the sun set around 8 o'clock, he and I would slip off in a cab, go to Georgetown, to a place called Blues Alley, where we'd have a phenomenal dinner, and the best time he and I ever had, we set up for an hour and a half listening to Nancy Wilson just sing, eating steak and lobster and having the time of our lives. And um, so I want to thank Don for, for teaching, teaching me balance. It is a great, great place. And Don afforded me the greatest honor that I think a friend could afford another friend. I mean, he's been in this business for a long time. He's highly respected from Washington to California. He had a huge uh, party uh, celebrating his time as supervisor. And he asked me, out of all of the people that he knows, he asked me to be the MC of that event. And it was my honor and my pleasure to do that for my dear friend. Ladies and gentlemen, an individual that is a true public servant, an individual that we will miss in this business, an individual that if we had more people like Don, then this country would not be as divided as it appears to be now, it would be more united because Don would put the focus on s settling or fixing the problem, yeah. not on BS and theatrics or what have you, because that is not Don Canabi. So it is my honor to stand with uh, Mr. Buscaino and Mr. Bonin and talk to you about one of the biggest influences in my political life. My dear friend, a man that I love, a man that I care about, a man that if he needs me, I am one phone call away, and that is Supervisor Don Canabi, one of the greatest supervisors of all times. Let's give him a round of applause. Uh, Mr. Weston, uh, before uh, our esteemed supervisor speaks, uh, there are a couple members on the queue. Should we have them speak first? Okay. Uh, starting with Mr. Cedillo. Oh, and Mr. Cedillo, before you start, I'd like to point out that uh, Mr. Akala and Mr. Spindler are both making a lot of crazy motions and disrupting the meeting, and I will warn them once for that, and anybody else um, it will move you if that continues. Yes. Um, Mr. Mr. President, Mr. Weston, thank you for, for those um, great memories. And, and um, Mr. Bonin and Mr. Buschino, thank you also. Uh, I basically want to repeat what everybody said. And so, um, just let me say this. There's a couple things uh, uh, that I learned from, from um, Mr. Kanabi, from the supervisor. You're talking about preparing us to go to Sacramento. Uh, with him, everything was bipartisan or nonpartisan. It just was. Uh, with Don, it was always to be service focused and to be result focused. There was no issues, no, no, I, you know, no, he's not an ideologue. Uh, he's a problem solver. Uh, he's looking for ways to solve problems. Uh, I admire his safe surrender program, uh, your commitment to Rancho Los Amigos, uh, commitment to libraries, the commitment to, to putting away our waste, uh, fond memories around the Northridge earthquake and how quickly we all rallied together uh, to rebuild the freeway. Um, and like you, he was the beginning of my career. Now, I didn't have the privilege of being on staff with the county. As you know, I was at Local 660 representing the uh, county workforce. And, um, you know, our, our entree was kind of 
tumultuous. Uh, the 11 day strike called Rolling Thunder was the first thing we did uh, eight weeks after I took that job. Uh, but uh, the next year, we had several elections in our union because that's what SCIU does. And uh, we came out of a trusteeship. Our union had been taken over and uh, brought in uh, managers and redid our constitution. And the first meeting I had, the very first meeting I had as the head of Local 660 was with Don Kanabi. And it was at the uh, city club. It was an early morning meeting. And we were talking about the delicacies of the election, our political program, uh, Dean Dana's uh, re-election, and how we could walk through that without having any uh, damage to our relationship. And that worked out fine. And it set an example for, for working with Don. Uh, you're absolutely right, Herb. He prepared us to go to Sacramento. Because when I went to Sacramento, I immediately, like you, would walk across the aisle to go talk to our other colleagues to see if we could solve a problem. And people said, oh, you're bipartisan. And I thought, I wasn't sure if they were being offensive at first. <laughs> and I said, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, no, this is the way we work at the county. You know, we look to solve problems. And of course, with Don, uh, I always called just to see if there was how we could solve a problem. Uh, and, and Mike, you're absolutely right, uh, Mr. Bonin. It just moves to the next issue, you know. And uh, most of the time we could get there, and if we couldn't get there, we just moved on to the next one. Uh, and that was it. Now, I, I do have the fondest of memories of that incredible year, 1995, where we all worked together to try to save the hospital, the libraries. Uh, you know, Jesse Jackson was uh, at, the, at the hall all the time with us, and Tom Hayden, and uh, he really, uh, Jesse Jackson really enjoyed you and wanted to know who, uh, who that guy was and what was he up to and how are we going to get this done. <laughs> uh, those are some heady times for, for young, uh, young staffers, young supervisors, young union leaders, and, and they're the fondest of memories. The thing I admire most, finally, just let me say this. I really, as a father, respect and admire the relationship you have with your son and really admire, as, as uh, the president said, um, your balance and your, your love of family. It's just uh, incredible. It's a great lesson for us. Uh, you're a teacher, a mentor, uh, and a real, true, consummate public servant, and I thank you for that. Mr. Rue? Thank you, Mr. President. And I just want to rise and say thank you, Supervisor Don Kanabi. Um, thank you so much for all your years of service. And I just have to say, working in the county, you set, um, I mean, you taught by example. Your office, um, yourself and your office was the most accessible, most collaborative. And even after Supervisor Burke retired and I left the county, um, you were still accessible to me personally. I mean, you were just amazing um, and always gracious, always humble. Um, you will be sorely missed. And I mean, you did it all. Uh, I'm going to miss your birthday parties at the Queen Mary. Um, I'm going to, I mean, I've seen you, I've seen Supervisor Kanabi rap before <laughs> um, as an MC, and, and I can see why you picked her, because I don't think no one comes even close to your MC skills. And, um, and as an Asian American, um, I really want to thank you because you were and you are the de facto Asian American to the point where at one point the Japanese American, American community even to this day think you're Japanese. <laughs> Especially because of your last name but you are nothing but um, all about inclusion, um, all about embracing others and you really set the example of what an elected official is and I really want to thank you for all your service supervisor. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Rue. And, uh, uh, I haven't sat at this seat previously, um, and Mr. Wesson may be sorry that he put me up here uh, because I want to roast just slightly. Um, first, I do want to say there's probably nobody that's more respected on both sides of the aisle in this entire county. Um, Democrats are proud of you. Republicans are proud of you. You have accomplished so much and in the most respectful and bipartisan way that that could ever be. Um, 
except for me. Uh, I did run for the water board in 2006, <laughs> and uh, ah, Don signed a hit piece against me, <laughs> and it said the worst thing that you could say, which is the truth. It said, Paul Koretz is a liberal Democrat and a former West Hollywood council member. And this is a district that, that is non-contiguous, West Hollywood and then El Segundo and other places. He sent it to Republicans and I lost by 1%. <laughs> and so he is responsible for my council career because had I won, I would be on the West Basin <laughs> Water District Board and not on the LA City Council. Yeah. So uh, I, I, have to, I have to thank you for that one bit of partisanship and <laughs> otherwise an amazing bipartisan and remarkable career. So um, let me, before you speak, let me, um, this is a resolution on behalf of the mayor of the city of Los Angeles and its entire city council body recognizing your leadership and commitment to public service. Supervisor Don Kanavi, ladies and gentlemen. The floor is yours, Don. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I'm Mr. President, members, uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here. I, I, I would add that uh, if you drop the K from my name, Nave in Japan means frying pan, so I'm, I guess I'm in the right profession. So, um, And just one other factual update. Uh, since Safe Surrender was started in 2001, we've saved 149 babies. Wow. The booze behind me just sort of bring back memories of yesterday at the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> uh, it's always a pleasure. Transparency, is America great or what? Um, I would just say to, to all of you, and, and being in these chambers, uh, I go back to a lot of mayors, starting with Tom Bradley. Uh, and actually, before that, uh, my original entry into the city of Los Angeles, Ace Estes, your former CLA, way, way, way back. And uh, we always hosted the president of Optimus International here in Los Angeles, and I was very involved in the Optimist organization. Um, I truly appreciate the kind remarks, and um, Herb and I do go way back, and, and Mike and I go way back uh, to Jane Harmon days and others, and uh, it's been a great relationship with many of you in this room, and uh, you know, Gil, I appreciate the, those kind remarks. Uh, they weren't so kind when you were president of 660, but, <laughs> um, <it's>, uh, <laughs> but we worked together. And again, we got through uh, Rolling Thunder and, you know, those banners, you know, where my kids would look up in the sky and said, Dad, they really don't like you. <laughs> um, but seriously, at the end of the day, it's been an incredible run. Um, 15 years with Dean and 20 years as the 4th District Supervisor. So uh, to all of you, uh, uh, I just uh, a heartfelt thanks. Uh, Joe, and it's been a pleasure working with him and what we, we were able to finish yesterday. Uh, for on behalf of the city of LA and what's going to happen in San Pedro, uh, it's going to be remarkable. And I appreciate his leadership, appreciate Mike's leadership on the south side and the west side and some of the projects. And Herbie's just been a, a dear, dear friend uh, for, for, for many, many years. And uh, you can't trade all of that. It feels like you get a PhD in life uh, when you're in local government. You know, I mean, one minute you're talking about, you know, flush a toilet, go to jail, to a major development, to, you know, you name it. Uh, and this is where the rubber meets the road. I mean, this, you know, I tell everybody that this, to me, my job, you may think yours is, but mine's the greatest political job in America. Uh, and in the sense that you get to work in a non-label form of government. Yes. Non-label. Uh, you know, you maybe have the partisan issues, a ballot initiative or something like that. But at the end of the day, whether it's a homeless problem, whether it's an AIDS problem, whether it's a public safety problem, there's no difference between the residents of the 4th District, the 1st District, 2nd, 3rd, or 5th District. Uh, and so being able to focus on that when you walk into the Hall of Administration down to the Board of Supervisors room uh, to be able to work together and then if you agree or disagree but move on to the next project because, you know, like you, no one calls your office, no one calls my office to say thank you. They call because they're hurting. And at the end of the day, that's our responsibility to people that put us in public office. And I have been blessed and honored to have that uh, for the last 20 years and then 15 with Dean. And, um, you know, it was nice being able to go into the Board of Supervisors, as Herb knows, and he gave me a lot of kind of remarks, but being able to go onto the board and, and 
know where all the pots of money were and where all the bones were buried uh, was really a head start and a, sure. a jump ahead. And uh, so I've, I had that opportunity, and I have to thank Dean Dana for that. And then personally, I mean, obviously, when you chase 2 million people in 28 cities, you can't do it by yourself. I've had an incredible staff. Uh, over the last number of years, and I got two of them with me today. My chief of staff, Rick Velasquez, right over here. And uh, I didn't get Mike Bonham, but when Jane Harmon left, I got Rebecca Kim. Right, Rebecca. And uh, Rebecca's down in, the, in South Bay and Palos Verdes Peninsula, as well as uh, San Pedro and things. So to all of you, heartfelt thanks. Uh, it's been a great journey. I wish you all a a very, very happy Thanksgiving, and however you may celebrate the holidays, I hope they're joyful, peaceful, and most importantly, good health. So to all of you, there's another retread from the county standing right over uh, there. Miguel. How you doing? Miguel. But uh, again, thank you all for this very kind recognition. Uh, you've all been great friends, and, and going back many, many years with you and your bosses and everyone else, uh, I just can't say anything more than deep gratitude and thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. You're not going far enough. Hmm. I remember when Rick was a junior staff. I hired Rick as an intern. <laughs> wow. wow. I remember when he was a junior staff. We'd have staff meetings around and he wouldn't even speak. <laughs> John, just go in the back. Just go in the back. Okay. Mike. Just go in the back. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, public comment. Mr. Eric Previn, you can speak on 46, 48, and public comment. Yeah. Two items plus public comment, three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, th thank you, sir. It is Eric Previn from uh, CD2, and that was a very touching presentation to Supervisor Knobby. We. We very much appreciate his service. And um, on item uh, 48 today, we are featuring um, uh, LA Police Foundation um, donation. And of course, it's not from the Police Foundation itself. They're the, the front. It's actually from Sprint, uh, which are treasured partners who are going to be providing, um, in connection with the body cam program, about $29 million worth of this $70 million worth of cost. I think it's actually. Uh, it's a data package that they'll be providing. But here we have uh, a way of saying thank you. Uh, they have uh, provided 800 uh, cell phones for the, I believe it's called the, um, the connected, it's, it's helpful. It's for the police to connect to, the, to one another and they have fancy otter box cases. It's an $800,000 value, so the appropriate response is thank you. Um, and we have to simply say, and I know Mr. Rue will feel conflicted, that to AT&T, who he's in working diligently with right now, and to all of you who deal with AT&T, this is not, there's plenty of love in the room for all of our treasured telephonic uh, partners. Uh, one note is that on the, the item that Mr. Rue is going to be, we're trying to sell a property, they're trying to sell a property, and we may be the buyer, I just would ask that the, when AT&T sued the city to get $900,000 off their bill, uh, and we agreed, Krikorian agreed, we need to make sure that what we sell, the price the price of the property is reduced by $750,000 so that the public don't feel we're getting screwed by backdoor deals. Um, item 46, to shift to a brighter, nicer day. And by the way, is this inclusive of the public comment time? Uh, you'll get one minute from public comment. Additional so you have 18 seconds. Okay, after this. So I can, okay, good. So 46 is... Um, 
happy to see that Martinez, Cedillo, Harris, Dawson, and Weezer are, are speaking out for women equality in the waste management business. But do you have a different opinion, Mr. City Attorney? Because I have a minute public I, comment. I, I believe you, you have a minute you now to do now public comment. Okay, then give me the, I will shift to that. Thank you. I wanted to um, say before Thanksgiving that we, we got a hold of an email exchange between the LA City Council member Mitchell Englander's office and a woman named Marta Rodriguez in her 60s uh, who considers her local bus stop to be dangerous and had no way to get to her housekeeper and babysitter jobs. She contacted Mr. Englander uh, to help her uh, persuade the LA DOT to move the bus stop to a safer intersection. Two weeks later, uh, Mr. Englander and Mr. Moody uh, secured an agreement from LA DOT to relocate the bus stop. And Mr. Moody wrote in his email to Ms. Rodriguez, good morning, just wanted to share some good news with you regarding your request to relocate line 573. We have agreements from LA DOT and Metro to move the stop to Chatsworth and Woodley. And a few weeks later, uh, the bus stop is complete. I just wanna thank you, she wrote, um, Mr. Mitchell Englander and Eric Moody for your help, kindness and consideration. And Ms. Rodriguez wrote, God bless you all and your staff always. And in conclusion, I just wanna say, um, he wrote to her that saying that the staff work so hard and that it's always nice to hear from them. And I would just like to say thank you. Thank Great you, Mr. President. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Walsh. Uh, Mr. Walsh, you can speak for Three minutes on 13, 47, 48, 49, 50, and 51. John Walsh blogging at hollywoodhighlands.org, number 47, and uh, you, hollywoodhighlands.org, tweeting at Hollywood Dems. Reap, uh, this is Rent Escrow, uh, uh, number Police Foundation. The Police Foundation uh, is as crooked as Hillary's Foundation and Trump's Foundation. It's just a way to launder money for their friends. Put benefit of the uh, Newton area's juvenile impact. Always use children. We're doing it for the kids. We're doing it for the kids. Uh, you're not even going to discuss this. This needs to be, uh, we need, we need a, a complete investigation and audit of the Police Foundation. Uh, you got three agenda items on the Police Foundation and you're not doing a damn thing about side, now, sidewalk improvements. Uh, okay. Mr. Walsh, I hate to interrupt you, but uh, um, we have a gentleman in the audience who's continuing to gesture and I'm going to have to ask that Mr. Herman be That's removed. That's fine with me. So if, <laughs> if our staff could remove him, please, uh, that would be appreciated. And he's continuing to uh, uh, yell out and disrupt the meeting. And he's continuing uh, to disrupt the meeting. That's so okay. you got to understand. Corrupt is a racist. He lets the white people get away with it. Mr. Not Herman is still the uh, disrupting the meeting as he's yelling. Okay. And he's still yelling. Their idea of a good meeting is a meeting without any blacks or Hispanics in the audience. Number 51, transferring funds to the sidewalk improvement projects. Well, at least Price and Cedillo were doing this. Uh, in Hollywood, the Hollywood Walk of Fame is a monstrosity. And uh, it is a, uh, the entire United States of America go there and they say, this is the Hollywood Walk of Fame? But that's because uh, our people who uh, run things, uh, our city councilmen, don't give a damn, or well, we'll get rid of our city councilmen uh, and the ballot box coming up uh, pretty soon. But uh, number 13, I didn't mention number 13, and uh, hollywoodhighlands.org, Jay Walsh Confidential, tweeting at Hollywood Dems. And uh, alcoholic beverages. Remember, it's a disgrace. We have the highest 
the highest rate of, uh, of hit and runs in America and the highest percentage uh, per square mile of liquor licenses. The blood is on your hands, Mr. Bonin. The blood is on your hands. You have never voted against the liquor license. Gay or straight, you're 100% in favor of every bar and you make me sick to my stomach to think about it, what's happening. And the percentage of people who are run over are largely minorities because they walk more, because they don't have the money to buy a car. You people are vomitous. Now I'm, I'm gonna give you back your five seconds and then go into uh, general public comment. Let's get something straight here. Let's get, we got these people up here jerking off this mutual jerk off about Don Canabi, what a wonderful person he is. I thought you were gonna do the Lewinsky thing on him. Not one member of the public got up and said one positive thing about Don Canabi. Don Canabi is being booted out because of term limitations which was passed statewide and locally. And then the scumbag Buscaino says, oh, the public should, there should be election. Let me tell you, Buscano is in here because Janice Hahn got her ass kicked out by term limitations. And now that he's in there, he has the goddamn nerve to say, let's get rid of uh, term limitations. And I, I'm not here to whine and whimper. We won. We got rid of Jackie Goldberg. We got rid of Xavier Oslowski. We got rid of Mike Antonovich. We got rid of them to term limitations, and we'll get rid of all of you scumbags pretty soon under term limitations. We're not losers, we're winners. Term limitations. Uh, Mr. Akala, are you passing on your speech? You can start this time. Oh, he's, I'm sorry, he's speaking on items one through 13 and items 46 through 53. Who, me? 52, you have, yes. I can barely understand you, sir. You speak like, uh, like this. I don't even understand my, when you call my name. Why don't you speak a little more clearly? Uh, Please speak another. to the item. Yeah, the item is uh, 13, 13, um, Liquor licenses and uh, an item of necessity. Who the fuck needs who? Who needs liquor? Do you know anybody that absolutely needs liquor? And uh, you're gonna make it easy so they don't have to go to Target or any of those cheaper stores to get liquor, uh, Walmart, uh, they're going out of business, most of them. They used to sell a lot of liquor. No more liquor for you, baby. What about fat turkeys? Where do we get a fat turkey? Well, there's one sitting here, but we're not gonna say who that I'll is. I'll warn you again to keep to the item. One more time, we'll have to have your moved. Oh yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't agree with uh, that liquor stuff. It's, uh, it's not for the birds uh, or the humans or anybody. I marked the other item here, but you have such a convoluted agenda that I can't find it. Hold on. Uh, I still have a minute. Uh, it has to do with uh, rent escrow and uh, all those things. I don't think the city should be uh, ruling much on real estate. I, I think we need a, a different way of running real estate. We don't need a, a goddamn president like Donald Trump controlling all this real estate. And uh, you know, it's, it's the wrong system. It creates homelessness. You guys say there is a homeless crisis. Well, who the hell is creating it other than the landlords? Why don't we change landlordship to another system? 
where everybody has a little place to live and nobody goes without a place to live. Instead of having Donald Trump somehow stealing the election and getting elected somehow, mysteriously, and uh, controlling all the real estate in the world. And that asshole's got more enemies than you know. Uh, where is my three minutes? You got one minute for public comment. Yeah. It's all going to be about the new fucking elected president, motherfucking son of a bitch. He speaks just like I do, so don't worry. Don't worry about a speech impediment. That son of a bitch uh, should be impeached already. There is millions and millions of signatures already uh, ready to get him out. He has divided not only this country, this whole world. And the guy uh, is going to be full of uh, Mexican chorizo all the way from his mouth to his ass. Believe me, he's going to know what chorizo tastes like all the way to hell. So uh, you think I like Donald Trump? No, I don't. Fuck you, Donald Trump. Fuck you, too. Next speaker is going to be uh, Wayne from Encino. And you're signed up for items 1 through 13, 46 through 52A, and general public comment. OK, go ahead, Mr. Piggy. Yes, thank you, thank you. So now we get to the subject of liquor licenses. Uh, pig has liquor, you drink the liquor, and then you drink more and more liquor, and then you go down to CD5, and you run over a family of children crossing the street. Yes, and then another one gets drunk and beats his wife, and then another one beats his kid. You could stop this by stopping the sales of liquor. You can deny all liquor licenses now, forever. But because of campaign donations and because of money being taken for bribery, they call it donations, but it's bribery, and the lobbyists, like England, there cannot be an Allen, they get liquor licenses to basically harm children and women. It's very, very, very sad. Sad to see the criminals on this council supporting rape, supporting abuse of women, and supporting drunkenness. According to statistics, the cost of drunkenness and alcoholism, which is a disease that is not curable, only recovering at most, is in the billions and billions of dollars liver damage, health damage, homelessness due to addiction. And it's all can be stopped under the 21st Amendment. It can be stopped as a regulatory denial of liquor licenses in family and residential neighborhoods. But you people are pigs. You have to get those campaign donations and keep killing us. Now we go to something called a criminal organization it's called the Los Angeles Police Foundation. And you know what they do like Hillary? They file a nonprofit status so they don't pay any taxes. They don't pay any taxes on their property taxes. They don't pay any taxes on their income. And they use this to launder money from private developers and contractors into this foundation. And then they give the money to Charlie Beck who uses the money to kill minorities and kill people and beat people and terrorize political enemies of this room. And this is why Donald Trump needs to shut down the Hillary Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, and the Los Angeles Police Foundation needs to be shut down as a criminal money laundering enterprise. It is not a nonprofit. It is a money funneling criminal conduit. Thank you. 
No, no, kids. You saw people get thrown out of this meeting today. And nobody disrupted any meeting. Because according to the California Supreme Court, in the city case of the city of Redondo Beach, an actual disruption has to occur to cause the meeting to be incapable of continuing for there to be a disruption. Nothing happened. It's just because Don Kanabi was here and Englander Kanabi and Allen, one of their partners is his son, and his son gets campaign donations, and they've been funneling this money to him for 20 years. Now, because of term limits, Don Kanabi, the criminal, is gone. Yay! And Zeb is gone, too. And pretty soon, everybody here will be gone, except I want David Rue, and I want Marquise Harris Dawson to have lifetime exemption from term limits. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Neubauer for item 48 and 50. And also one minute after that for general public comment. Okay, so uh, we are confusing the issue so the speaker doesn't know what he's talking about. Is that the latest procedural trick? What's the total time allotment? Uh, you'll get three minutes, one minute for each of the two <coughs> items and one right. minute for general public comment. Well, unfortunately, um, I did survive Vietnam, so I'm not confused. You'll have to get over it. Um, my father helped build the atomic bomb. E. Ted Neubauer, he was an engineer at the Manhattan Project. Years ago, he took, uh, he took a uh, business trip to Chicago, and he had one of Chicago's finest, finest walk up to his car, lay his burly arms on the Window, car window his cell and say, I need some supper money. And my father, being somewhat independently minded, refused to comply. So he comes back to his car the next morning, and uh, it's been broken into, and everything inside tossed. Nothing taken, just tossed. So hence the term, uh, as applied to LAPD, hence the term supper money machine. And I... Um, in the future, when I use the term supper money machine, you'll know what I'm talking about, okay? Um, I note, as a former candidate myself, that it takes eight times the number of signatures to run Sir, for city council. At, at some point, you've got to get to the topic. I'm you're, sorry? You're on some items. You're not talking about them. <clears throat> So we're regulating content now in violation of the First Amendment? No, you're supposed to speak to the item that you've signed up for. Okay. Let's... All right. Um, let's ad address item 50. I have how much time left? 30 seconds? 30 seconds. <laughs> Terrific. Let's... Let's... Um, Dispute resolution, let's, let's talk about item 50. Dispute resolution, um, when are they gonna re, uh, uh, resolve my dispute? I posted $160 with the DMV, my work truck is in the impound. See the hat? I'm a Vietnam veteran. Oh, the uh, receipt was posted in the window. Apparently the city pays no attention, okay? They, they so have one minute for public comment, general public comment. You're in violation of the First Amendment and the Brown Act, okay? Okay, so when do they, is the microphone on now? You're in violation, okay? When are they gonna di dispute their, uh, solve their um, resolution w with my dispute? I have posted, I posted, showed good faith, posted $160 out of my homeless income with the DMV, okay? When are they, when are they gonna recognize that? What, what's this item on the uh, our exec, um, police commission? 2A, towing and storage. 
rates for 2017, they're making $500 an hour now. They do two an hour. You're, you're not making enough money. $500 an hour is not enough money. $15 an hour for the individual is supposed to be a big deal. You're still in violation of the Brown Thank Act. Thank you. Your time is up. Amendment. Thank you. Uh, you can't shout out from the audience. If you shout out from the audience again, we'll have to ask that you have to leave. Uh, she's still disrupting the meeting. Second time. All right, next we're going to vote on items 1 through 12, members. Uh, if we could open the roll. Close the roll. Tally the vote. 11 ayes. And Mr. President, those ordinances will go over one week to November 30th for a second read. Colleagues, let's vote on items number 46 through 52. If we could open uh, the roll. Uh, pardon me, sir. Uh, if we could vote on 47 through 52, that would be appreciated. There has been an amended motion for 46A that has been circulated, and we should vote on uh, 46 separately. Great. All right. We will open the roll on 47 through 52. We can open the roll. Close the roll and tally the vote. 11 ayes. Mr. President, would you like to do item 46 uh, at this time? Again, if so, there has been, uh, or there is an amending motion, uh, 46A, that has been circulated for this matter. Yes, and we have no speakers on the queue on that, so if we could uh, open the roll on that item. Close the roll. Tally the vote. 11 ayes. All right, let's go to item number 13. We have two speakers. Um, the first speaker is Patrick Siemens. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the council. Uh, how much time will I be allotted? Uh, I probably should give them two minutes, a minute for translation. And let's, let's give them two, just wish two minutes with the translation time. Thank you. I just wish to know if all of you have already received these particular documents. And I'm going to go ahead and let my interpreter read this aloud for me. My name is Patrick Siemens, a board member of Mid City West Community Council, County District 5, or City District 5. I thank Mr. Koretz and Mr. O'Farrell for recognizing me as an honoree in the Deaf Awareness Month of 2015. I am speaking for Dr. Coswell, immediate residential neighbor near the CVS store. She couldn't be here for personal reasons. The CVS application was never vetted through the Mid City. Community Council at the Planning and Land Use Committee at the board level. The building itself was previously vetted for a different applicant, fresh and, fresh and ready. Dr. Caswell filed an appeal with the Central Area Planning Commission. At the first commission meeting I attended, the appeal was postponed to the next meeting because of lack of a quorum. Only two commissioners and the chair were accused due to a relationship with CVS. At the second meeting I attended, again, two commissioners and the same chair were accused, lack of a quorum. But 
two of the commissioners then denied the appeal without hearing and do, giving it due process. That is an inappropriate, and this is an inappropriate procedure. The appeal should have stayed at the Central Area Planning Commission level until the appeal was fully heard. Therefore, I strongly suggest and encourage, as well as request, that this item regarding the CVS store be sent back to the commission for reconsideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Patrick. Mr. Mohammed. And since I gave Mr. Siemens two minutes, and since most of that wasn't translation, I think I have to give you two minutes as well, in fairness. So we'll give you two minutes. Yes, I'm speaking against the uh, alcohol license. Too many alcohol licenses is in Los Angeles. Los Angeles should be forbidden for drinking alcohol. Alcohol create drunk driving. Drunk driving create a whole lot of partying and a whole lot of something that we we can we don't know how to control. But anyway, uh, seem like we put uh, profit before help. This, yeah, this word seems like seems as though we put profit before help. I guess there's more money into uh, alcohol and drunk driving, you know, and lawyers and doctors fee, you know, than to not to sell not to sell alcohol. But uh, anyway, I see downtown Los Angeles, we full of you know, full of, you know, got a lot of alcohol bars, and I think the majority of the people who come down there do not, uh, you know, do not live in Los Angeles. But down there for Stockton and Crenshaw, they got a great big liquor barn down there. And, all, and they got just so much alcohol, but it looked like one community is treated one way and another com community is treated another way. All across Los Angeles, we got alcohol, but outside of Los Angeles, where the, uh, where the other American people live, they don't see alcohol in their community like we see in our community. We got to find a way to uh, have separate but equal, though, separate but equal try to find a way to treat all citizens, all citizens equal, equal under the law of the United States Constitution. But some type of way, uh, we public, public, uh, public, public uh, leaders, I think they'll put their hand on the uh, Constitution to uphold the law of the United States. It seems like they're not doing it. It seems like they have got diverged and went another direction. But anyway, uh, we got to try to find a way to bring in a new solution because this where we're going today is not getting it. Thank you. There's no speakers on the queue, so uh, if we could uh, open the roll on this item. Close the roll, tally the vote. 11 ayes. All right, we have general public comment left. Uh, yes, sir. The, uh, First speaker will be Yvonne Michelle Autry. Yes, I also think that there are enough licensed uh, dispensaries of uh, liquor in Los Angeles not just for this holiday, but probably for the next century. For the record, especially because of the conservative election results, uh, I'd like to request reparations, 40 acres and a mule, and all compensation for uh, African American people who built this country. If it wasn't for our 400 years of free slave labor, America would not have its economic status today. All the resources are going to Hispanic immigrants I am not a racist or other or police. You know, give something to black people. And in, 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 in your uh, determining where the money is going for your budgeting, for homeless people, we need a recovery of skills training and housing. And do not give the police the money that they're asking for. This will not be a police state under, under martial law, for the record. Give the money to senior citizens, children, and housing for the homeless, which is engineered for those people you're trying to exterminate and put in the trash. This is civil engineering. And also, 
Thank you. Um, next speaker is Jacqueline Richardson. The baby making business. <clears throat> Some men have 100 children. Do you know any unmarried uh, ladies that have children and the man or the husband or whatever doesn't come around? These beautiful ladies may be the victim of the baby making business. It is a business. Girls and ladies cannot men let men touch or fondle their bodies, or else those men can trick them and give them a baby. These men are everywhere, friends, church, schools, work. Some of these men have regular jobs and are of all races and colors. They're after nice girls, nice girls. They have to be careful not to let the men uh, touch them. It is a business, it is a business that should be shut down. It's not a joke, it's a business, a hidden business. It happens all the time. It's a Thank business. You. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Jason. And you'll have one minute. I go longer. Respect. I am here to report an egregious and as, and as of yet ongoing crime. I have provided the U.S. government with and made public the information, evidence, and proof with which to investigate and verify my allegations. Yet the government continues to disregard and cover up the matter because, because it is yet another example of institutional racism and corruption. <clears throat> My question to the forum is, what should one do when being victimized by the government? My ultimate intent and attitude is peace, respect, illumination, and healing. Apparently, my allegations and accusations and detailed, documented, and substantiated reports uh, and my voice are being ignored and not respected because I was purposely and wrongfully institutionalized and classified mentally ill in order to cover up reports. Thank you. Your, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Your time is up. You, you can't speak after your time is up. Thank you. Your, the next speaker will be uh, Omar. Uh, he's, uh, you're disrupting the meeting, sir. You, I don't want to have to remove you, but you can't just keep talking. I wish you did too, but you don't, so you, you can't keep talking. Um. Um, I was a victim of an arson fire at 690 South Burlington Avenue. Some of you might know about it. I listed all of my facts and findings. It's um, arsononburlington.wordpress.com. I don't know if anybody's read it. But um, my house was taken from me as a primary renter from the owner, and it was given away as a multiplex complex C2 zoning for an R1 historic home. And I've spoken to just about every department in this building. And I was forcibly, constructively evicted by my house by an attempted murder arson on July 9th, 2013. I lost my pets. Station 11 under Lawson and Emil Mack threw me out of my house and told me to go somewhere else. I'm living on the streets, and this is your homeless problem in the city of Los Angeles. And it seems terroristic. This is economic terrorism, and I'm suffering on the streets eating trash at your expense. Excuse me. Thank you. 
Oscar Mohamed. <clears throat> we should end the homeless downtown Skid Row. The United States government still treat the minorities, outcasts, inhuman. The, the black folk living on Skid Row living worse than animals, and nothing been did about their condition. But it seemed like it's just a big money game. But there's a big severe, uh, severe mismanagement of the resources. It should be cut out. <clears throat> we should try to find a way to uh, end homelessness. In, 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 this, in Skid Row, only invite more oh. uh, our right. environment, Thank only you. invite more, more, more evil and wicked temptation downtown Los Angeles. In the United, in the, and you get no service from the uh, police department. The police department should be abolished and turned into a bar scout. Uh, uh, no, not a bar scout department. Turn it to a cuff, no. Turn it to a peace, peace, peace patrol and take the funds they be getting away from them and let them walk the street and bring them from their luxury living. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, is there any other business before us? Mr. President, Council has motions for posting and referral. We could ask that those be posted and referred. The desk is clear. Uh, any announcements, colleagues? Mr. Buscaina. If, if I may, Mr. Mr. President, uh, today, Council District 15, my office is looting, losing an in incredible team member, Eliana Garcia. In fact, she couldn't make it. She's upstairs right now. Um, Eliana's going to move on um, to bigger and better things, working for the city of Duarte. So I know you're listening, Eliana. Thank you so much for your commitment and dedication to Council District 15. We're going to miss. Oh, here she is right here. So help me um, recognize Eliana for her commitment to the city and wishing her our love and our best as she moves on to the city of Duarte. So uh, just in recognition of, of her commitment. And she was my go-to person with my um, Espanol translations, and she was a rock star. But Eliana, I know uh, you're going to do great, great work moving forward. We love you. We're going to miss you. And just know uh, you're not going too far. So thank you. And we all wish you best of luck. Um, any other uh, announcements? If not, uh, let's all rise for uh, adjourn in the memory. Adjournments in the memory. Uh, Mr. Wesson, do you have an adjournment? Oh, Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. President. It's always hard to do an adjourning motion for a friend that you've lost, and I think that our, our President Herb Wesson uh, yesterday uh, on the adjourning motion of his good friend uh, illustrated that beautifully well. I lost one of my best friends uh, 10 days ago uh, on November 12th, uh, Diane Kelly. Uh, Diane Kelly and I became very, very close friends uh, back in 2000. We had been, uh, we had met in social circles and socialized uh, amongst mutual friends previous to that. And, uh, George and I became really good friends with Diane and her husband, Roberto, uh, back in 2000. And we bonded precisely because she was fighting cancer. Uh, she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, and we had, uh, I had a, a day off during the week. And uh, we began socializing and spending time together, just doing basic things together. Uh, she recovered through, through that um, serious illness through uh, aggressive treatment, including stem cell replacement. And I learned of her courage and her fearlessness then, and we became even closer. Well, one of the things that Diane did was uh, she and Roberto had always been adventurous and gone to the desert and hiked and traveled the state of California and taken advantage of the splendor uh, that can be found throughout this lovely state and region in Southern California, the desert, the mountains, the sea, you name it. She and Roberta were adventurers. So a group of us, including Roberto and Diane, began hiking 
we set several goals. We went to Yosemite. We spent a wonderful uh, half week there and hiked Half Dome and had great times. And we set our sights on summiting Mount Whitney, the highest point in the contiguous United States. And, and we hiked Mount Whitney. Um, and that was uh, about a, a year after 9-11. Uh, after um, and Diane had lost an uncle, uh, a John Kelly, who was part of the Port Authority in 9-11. Our lives became intertwined very, very closely with uh, Roberto and Diane, and some years ago, uh, they moved to Roberto's hometown of Boise, Idaho, Idaho uh, where they uh, spent their time until Diane's passing 10 days ago. Uh, Diane was uh, iconoclastic. Um, she was a fearless intellectual. Uh, she had a high, uh, placed a high priority on social justice, and she was always rooting for the underdog. Um, her last and very, very proud sort of stand was making it to the polls on November 8th to cast her vote for Hillary Clinton. And in the state of Idaho, that was an act of bravery. Uh, and she was able uh, to uh, get to the polling booth. And when she arrived, she got a standing ovation because she was in such um, uh, poor shape uh, at that time, but she did make it uh, to the polls to vote. She um, spent the rest of her career as chief of staff uh, for the Democratic Party in the State House there in Boise, Idaho. Um, she is already missed. She's made a profound impact on my life. I always considered her my third fierce Irish sister, um, uh, uh, and she was just that kind of a person. Uh, and we all have those kind of people in our lives, and I think that in the spirit of Thanksgiving, it's always good to reflect on those that we love and those that we've lost and take a moment to appreciate all that we have in this season of giving and this season of thanks. Um, she is survived by her wonderful circle of friends there in Boise, Idaho, and many, many more here in Southern California, in the Los Angeles area. And the love of her life, Roberto Cineceros, who is our, our dear friend, uh, and she will be missed. Diane Kelly, we are with you in spirit and will forever be. May you rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Uh, still looking to my right, Mr. Wesson. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. President, and, and say that you did one heck of a good job today, uh, Mr. Koretz, uh, and you will be called upon again. <laughs> uh, I rise, uh, members, to adjourn on behalf of our dear friend and our colleague, Nuri Martinez, uh, for her father, Isidro Martinez, who passed away on November 14th of this year. I know I was proud yesterday, and I'm sure that Nuri was touched as well when we, as her colleagues, we, as the council, of Los Angeles were there in such huge numbers that there were a total of 11 of us there, and which is almost impossible given all of our schedules, okay? It's almost impossible, and the fact that we only have 14 members at this time. So, so I was honored to stand there with you guys, and, and I, I just know that, that, that she was, uh, touched as well. I mean, her, uh, Nuri's dad, um, he leaves his wife of 45 years, Julia. And when you look at the Julia Isidro love story and life story, it's something that you could all but write a screenplay about. Think about it. They dated. Her parents dated for over 20 years. No way my wife would have waited for me for two. I'm surprised she's still with me, but for 20 years they dated. They were childhood sweethearts. She came to this country. He followed her 
I think he would have been happy to stay in, what is it, is it uh, Zacatecas, uh, uh, Mexico, where Mr. I think, I think we have two or three members that have roots that come from, from that area. Uh, her dad uh, was born to Luis and Trinidad Martinez in 1932. But he, he, he comes to this country to follow Nuri's mom five years later. And he was 35 at the time that he came. Five years later, 1971, they got married. And up until the time of his passing, his transition, they were together for 65 years. Mr. Martinez is a perfect example, I believe, of what being an American is all about, about the American dream. This man came to this country with next to nothing, worked almost 30 years washing dishes, hear me, as a busboy started out as a 35-year-old busboy. That's about as tough of a gig as there is. But he never complained, worked for a coffee shop, took the bus to work. Then he got a promotion because he got another job, and he went to work for a manufacturing firm, Fidel Manufacturing. And I think he, he stayed there until uh, he retired in 1995, but see what the American dream is about, members, the American dream is about you having a better life than your parents so that you can ensure that your children have a better life than you. And that's what he was able to do, to see one daughter become a social walk worker and another daughter become a member of this council and the highest ranking Latina to ever serve on this council, that this poor man, dishwasher from Zacatecas, could come. And when he passed, this council was delayed for more than two hours so that we could go to his funeral. So I rise on behalf of Ms. Martinez and uh, ask that we adjourn this day for an immigrant who became an American citizen who was able to cast his vote in this last presidential election for a perfect example of what makes this country great, what makes us right, and what all of us have to fight for over the next several years. We have to bring this country together. So with that said, I ask that we adjourn in the memory of a man who was pleased that for probably 40 years of his life, it was run by all women. <laughs> and that for Miss Martinez, who told each and every one of us that was there yesterday, that her father was her life. And that this is the most challenging thing she's ever had to deal with. So it is my honor that she would ask me to adjourn in her father's memory, and I just pray that I did it justice. So members, uh, thank you for listening, and we all rise to adjourn in the memory of a great man. Thank you, Mr. President. Did it justice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weston, for that beautiful adjournment. Still looking to my right, looking to my left. There being no further adjournments, we are adjourned. <laughs>